Hello and welcome to Access Chat. We're delighted to welcome Christine Hemphill today. Christine's the CEO of Open Inclusion and also um, a expert contributor to the Valuable 500, which um, Access Chat is also um, absolutely 100% behind, as is as is Apple. So um, we've been talking over the last. Oof, 18 months or so anyway, but it's great to have you here in your official capacity. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, and, and, and really, um, we've had conversations before, but um, it, it's great to have you joining the, the sort of Access Chat community. And, and I think you're going to talk today about a topic that, that affects us all, which is you know, access to finance and open banking, but, um, but also just if you wouldn't mind sort of introducing yourself and giving us a bit of your background, because if we Google for you, we, we see you're a triathlete and, you know, uh, a very, you know, very keen sports and, and very talented sports person uh, and not necessarily, people don't necessarily know about your work with open inclusion. So please tell us a bit about yourself. Yes, sadly, not quite such a such an active athlete anymore, but yeah, keeps me out of trouble still. Um, no, thank you, Neil. It's lovely to be here. I've been an avid supporter of the um, the chat show for a very long time, so yeah, thanks for the time today. Um, in terms of my background, um, I actually have a banking background. In fact, sport was a segue between my banking world and my inclusive design world, but. My background was um, I actually came from a few industries but ended up in, in the banking and particularly looking at service proposition design and it was in the early era of digital banking. So in the, the early, you know, through the noughties actually right through that decade, I worked in large retail banks in Australia and considered essentially how those services could be provided to customers more effectively, more you know, for, completely fulfilling people's needs. Um, by the end of that decade, I actually had some you know, personal experience of disability in my family. Um, weirdly enough, that triggered me to going and having a, a midlife crisis of the, the most positive form. I went and became a triathlete for a couple of years. And when I came back to, to the real world and, and to um, more normal work, came into digital design and, and specifically into inclusive design. And we established, I established Open in 2015 with the very clear aim of making inclusion what I saw it as, which is an enabler of great design, something that by understanding insight from the communities of people with specific needs and with more extreme needs, we could make products and services and you know, overall end-to-end -end solutions that were fundamentally better for everyone, that didn't exclude specific groups, that were incredibly useful for everyone as they had needs that, that kind of came in and out of their life. Um, I also saw it wasn't very, at the time, it just didn't feel like a very cool community or something that designers and um, innovators were leaning into. I saw this as, and I still see this as something that's an incredibly exciting tool for people who want to just be better at what they do and create better and more valuable um, uh, propositions, uh, whatever they are, whether they're internal in a workplace or external to customers. So to me, it was just absolutely blindingly obvious and, and we've worked very hard to do that. And Open specifically focus on helping people understand the voice of customer. So we do a lot of usability testing, insight, co-design, co-creation, co-innovation um, with a very large community across the UK of people who are um, have all sorts of different access needs who identify as disabled or may not identify as disabled um, and also a community that are over 65. So that's us. Excellent and, and, and thank you and, and I know uh, I'm, I'm familiar with some of your work and, and it's not just um, stuff that uh, you know there's good research there and it's not just Digital accessibility or the digital access it's you know, you know understanding physical access and and the whole the whole sort of totality around it as well so Neil, uh, it's a really good pick up and it's yeah. really important to me that I think about everything from the customer outwards I don't think of it from the solution backwards so 
it's not just limited to a certain part of a proposition. If somebody wants something done, they might touch on digital, they might touch on physical, they might speak to someone or engage with someone on a phone. Um, at the end of the day, to get that job done takes a whole range of different elements. And particularly now, as people tend to, you know, multi-channel has been talked about for decades, but is really very pervasive now, and pretty well everyone interacts in many different ways with a brand. So we can't solve problems if we don't look right across the experience, and that's something you know, we're very proud of working right across the experience. So, um, Christine, so we, we have people using uh, multiple banks. You might have, you no, know, you might have accounts on two or three banks. You might have a, an account in an app where you ba you manage all your bank details, and you can even have some gamification to help you to manage your finance. But some of the actions within the apps, uh, they are driven you to do the same type of actions, uh, a payment, a transfer. How do you make that consistent? Because sometimes you have an app and you do it in one way, you have another app, and then you have a step that you do it in another way, and in the end, you might be lost in all of that, and you might make mistakes. So mm -hmm. how can we improve uh, uh, the user side of the experience and at the same time, reducing the 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 overload in terms of the, the activities that the user needs to do within the app. It's a really good question, Antonio. And essentially, if you think about banking, you know, it's a fundamental enabler of independence. It's such an important part of our lives. Some people kind of go banking yawn. Um, the truth is, banking is such an important kind of fundamental foundational layer to so much of what we do. And the complexity that you're talking about there, particularly when you have multiple banks or multiple ways that you interact with financial services organisations, that makes it, it really difficult. It's also very important, which means your stress is quite high already. And then you add the layer of it's very opaque. It's very hard to see when I'm choosing that I wish to have a new banking service. Say I need a new credit card or I, I I'm looking to get a home loan or a car loan, or I have a specific banking need in mind. When I'm on the outside of the bank, looking in, trying to work out if that bank's going to support my needs best or not, I can see what they sell, but the personal needs I might have, whether I'm an assistive technology user, whether I particularly like simple language, whether I have difficulty with numbers, whatever my, my needs are, it's very, very hard to see whether that bank is going to support those needs well or not. And there's a huge difference between different banks in how well they support needs. So at the moment, this is a real challenge. Um, interestingly, open banking, where we can split the service layer from the product layer, so say, I want to get a mortgage, but I've already got three other accounts in different banks, and I don't like the organization's service layer when I'm doing those interactions, trying to make a payment, trying to deal with it. I find it difficult. There is more, there's potential for more fluidity. It's still potential because open banking hasn't really quite got the, the teeth or the momentum that I think it will have in the future. I think it'll be an exponential pickup, and at the moment we're in the slow stage of that. Um, so it's quite, it, it will be more possible in the future to have a service where you choose, you know what, I prefer my bank B to my bank A. I'd like to have the service layer that I use over there, not this one, and therefore I'll just draw the product information into that service layer and be able to be supported there instead of here. I think there's also an interesting point for designers and developers of you know, financial services, and actually of any services that have payment systems, that there is a recognition, this is a bit like the early 2000s, for those of us who are old enough to, to remember early days of uh, digital design. It started off with this plethora of design options and ways in which people interacted and affordances, you know, those things that we use to make it easier for people to understand what's likely to happen when you do something. Um, and they kind of proliferated very widely, and then there became some norms that became more and more uh, accepted and more used and more expected from users. And I think it's very important for banks, and particularly for those designers and developers, either in agencies or working in the banks, to recognise that there are quite um, recognisable patterns that should be followed as much as possible. We do want to innovate. We do want to make things better. 
But unless there's a really good reason for changing a pattern that people are used to, we also need simplicity as much as possible so that people can move from one organisation to another and not have to relearn from scratch. Oh gosh, it took a while to unmute there. That's a, a great point. And, and um, you mentioned the word that affordances, which is a uh, not often used, but really, really important, um, particularly for uh, you know cognition and understanding and everything else. So um, thank you for that. Let's keep affordances at the top of people's minds, and I'll let Deborah have her question. I just wanted to thank you for, for mentioning affordances because it's really important. Pleasure. Uh, yeah. Christine, thank you for being on the program. We really are excited about, you know, your wisdom that you're bringing to the community. Uh, I know that open banking is, you know, it, it started, I, I assume, I believe it started in the UK and it's starting to spread its way across the world. And of course, all of these financial institutions are all interconnected. So even if somebody is it is not in their country yet, it doesn't mean they should not be paying attention to it because we're all just so interconnected with all the financials. So, you know, what do, you know, what do people, what do, what do these banks and these financial institutions need to be thinking about to really get prepared for this? Because this isn't going to go away. This is going to keep, um, and it should, I believe it should, because as consumers, we should have choices. So I was just wondering, you know, where you think it's going to go, what advice you would have to the banks and the financial institutions that are listening, and, you know, how they can prepare. And by the way, the good news is, as they prepare for it, they're going to become more inclusive to all of their customers, as you've noted earlier in the program. So thank you. Absolutely. I mean, we've kind of talked about the problem side, which is this complexity, the importance and opacity. The lovely thing is, in banking at the moment, there's some fabulous solutions coming through. And this is an area that, yeah, I'm an optimist, you know that, Deb. Um, I'm an optimist at the best of times anyway, but I am really optimistic about what is happening in the financial services space at the moment. And essentially, the regulations that are coming through are enabling solutions that are bubbling up with smart people working in teams all around the world. Um, it's enabling that to come through in a more powerful way and more efficiently. So essentially on the solution side, there are some fabulous new solutions and some of those are digital solutions. Some of those are propositions, so people thinking differently about how to price and offer service bundles that are more relevant to people's lives as they live today. Um, there are new providers coming through. As I say, some of these are, are new regulated providers, big banks. Some of these are kind of small digital teams creating stuff they can sell to regulated providers. And some of these are not banks, but they're still financial institutions that are providing service layers that can be leveraged by regulations such as uh, open banking. We, it's what it's done is this has essentially very, very significantly reduced the barriers to entry to providers in financial services. So, you know, go back to the early day, you know, 1980s when the banks were, sorry, I'm going back into the dark ages, as my children would say, to when the banks were being deregulated from a lot of them being um, government organisations. And all of a sudden you had these very large, very powerful, quite oligopolistic, um, so very few players in a single market so that they had a lot of power to choose prices and to choose their own profit and not a lot of competition to bring that down. And what we're seeing now is this layer of deregulation is significantly changing the power away from the provider towards the consumer. And that is fabulous news for those consumers that have had their net needs quite significantly undermet up until now. They are valuable. There are some very large segments. In fact, some of the wealthier segments have some of the highest undermet needs. And what we're seeing is there is now an opportunity for whether it's product lines or whether it's a specific segment for a new player to come and say, I don't want to be a full service end-to-end -end bank. I'm not going to try and compete with Citibank or HSBC and create a footprint as large as theirs. That would take them you know, 50 years, 100 years to create. But you know what? I'm going to solve for that unmet need there that I understand and that I'm going to do significant research and significant design for, and I'm going to fix for that 
because that at the moment, there is no one in that space and that space is very open. And there are so many spaces in banking and finance, you know, and it's broadened it just outside of just banking to financial services more broadly, insurance and you know, other financial needs, um, that there is this, this opportunity that open banking provides. And just for those, I'll just take a step back and quickly say what open banking is. It sounds great. I work called open inclusion. I love the word open, obviously. It means we don't, you know, you know that the actual meaning of open is, is to, you know, allow more in, to, to not exclude. So, you know, open banking to not exclude sounds like a fabulous concept. The idea of it is it's very focused on digital banking. And what it does is it provides a consistent format for data to move between organisations that is secure and that is designed and defined by customers. Now these are really important things because at the moment if you choose, and, and Antonio you were talking about this before, if you say I've got two banks and you wish to um, have one versus another, today you'd need to move all of your money, all of the products underneath across from one to the next. And I'll use the train analogy. I quite like, I'm quite a physical person. You noted I was an athlete. Um, I often use physical analogies. If you think about it, the engine is the product. And today, and, and the rails are the data and the regulations that sit underneath that. And at today, the banks, well, up until recently, the banks have been the engine and the carriages and the regulator has provided the rails on which those trains are able to operate as a financial service. What's happened with open banking is those products, the engines of your financial security can stay the same, but you can swap out the carriages. And actually the customer experience is where you sit in the carriage. Yes, you can choose your, your product that goes faster or slower and what have you, but actually the majority of your experience comes from you know, the surroundings in the carriage. And what we're doing is we're enabled now to have many more multiple types of carriages that will suit many more types of specific needs. So a group that may have seemed like too small a group, say in the UK, um, the community of people who BSL is their first language. It's a very you know, important community, but it's not the biggest community. It's somewhere around 40,000 people where their preferred language is BSL. Previously, an individual bank might think, oh, I've probably only got a small portion of them. Can I be bothered investing and providing services? Now, someone can create a carriage specifically for them and they can think about um, providing a service that attracts all of that community to one place. They can still hold their products where they are, but they can provide a service layer that is really specifically and beautifully designed to support their needs. That's why open banking is so powerful for the inclusive design community. Very, very well said. And just for, if anybody doesn't know what BSL is, that's British Sign Language. Sorry, just thank you. <laughs> well, just just because we have yes. an audience in other countries too, so. Um, yes. And you had mentioned that, <clears throat> and I know that we're very proud to be one of your partners, so we do a lot of collaborating with your company. I'm very impressed with, with what y'all do. And, but we also, <clears throat> excuse me, are focused on the, the older generation as well, and I recently, a couple of months ago spoke at a very large multinational bank and their concerns, they had tried to do accessibility, they tried to do disability inclusion, they, they really have made a lot of efforts, but they're finding now that their high net worth individuals and even their executives have aged into disabilities and what is happening to the customers and the customer um, you know, their their assets um, are really, really freaking out this bank because they thought they were ready for what we have been telling them were, was coming for a long time. I know in the United States, there's over 70 million Americans that are now over the age of 56 considered in the baby, they're the baby boomers and they still control 60% of the wealth and I'm in that category of those, the baby boomers. Of course, the baby boomers are all over the world, but this is causing now a lot of a lot of companies to really start paying attention to this because we've been predicting it, we've been telling them, we've been telling them get ready, get ready, and now we're right in the middle of it. And it's 
it, and I find a lot of our customers are very confused. They thought they were putting all the things in place and they're not prepared. And so I, I didn't know if you wanted to, you know, talk about that a little bit. I'd love to. That's an absolutely fabulous and interesting question. Um, so, no, thank you. And in fact, the older community has some really specific and interesting um, needs that kind of come with it that mean that the way in which we're currently providing services is failing them in some quite, as you say, predictable ways. You know, when you're sitting within the community going, come on guys, we, we can fix this. Um, so a couple of quick things. Firstly, identity. With older people, the owning the identity of having an access need can be quite different to younger people with access needs. And that this is something that's not, you know, for everyone. And obviously there is no older community, just as there is no disabled community. There are many and, and you know, huge numbers of, of sub-communities within those. However, there is a significant difference between people who incur an impairment over 65 and those that incur it under 65 in terms of identifying as disabled. Quite often they'll identify as just being older. And you know, I've got a perfect example in my family where you know, my father lost his hearing quite young, identified as you know, having a hearing loss. My mother wouldn't say today that she has her, any hearing loss, yet her hearing is probably now at about the same level as my father's. So it's just that how it occurs and when it does and how normalised that is across your group of friends as well. So interestingly, as a service designer, that makes for an interesting challenge because if somebody doesn't identify as being disabled, if you have your, your access solutions hidden behind an accessibility um, menu, something that people have to reach into, they won't necessarily be found by people who don't yet identify as having a specific access need. So this is where providing the options and the fluidity of alternatives quite early in the experience without people having to reach in specifically becomes far more important with older communities than it does with younger communities. The other interesting thing about older people is there's a huge amount of wealth there. There's also changing needs. So some banks can look at people who are older and think, you're not borrowing money from me anymore. Actually, your lifetime economic value to me, maybe you've got five, 10, 15 years, you know, my actuarial studies will tell me what that is. And that's not very high. So maybe I don't bother servicing you very well. And I'm being, I said, I'm very optimistic. I'm being a little pessimistic here. People could decide that actually this isn't a space that they really need to focus on and that that they're not going to provide the same quality of service to that um, community. There's a very interesting corollary to that, which is how brand experience impacts people around them. And as people become more vulnerable, as people are in circumstances where they're needing additional care and support to manage their day-to-day -day, you know, banking and solutions, and Deb, I know you and I have had this conversation before, particularly about things like powers of attorney, at the moment, they're, they're very blunt tools and they're either on or off. So at a power of attorney, for those that don't know, is when you give the right to do your banking, your financial service or your legal activities to someone else and you delegate that right to someone under certain circumstances of, say, an injury, an accident or illness that's progressive. Today, it's an on or off. And in fact, as people age, they often need to hand that off in a layered way. They may have carers that they wish to provide some access controls to, but not full controls of banking. All of these are services that are incredibly valuable to consumers at that point in life and are very poorly provided today. And I think there's a huge opportunity to better solve for some of these changing needs and these gradients of needs um, as people are aging. And then lastly, you have end of life. And of course, this is a very messy moment where there's a lot of emotion, there's a lot of need, there's, and then there's family um, trying to pick it up. Over the course of a well-lived life, people may have many banking relationships. They may have quite complex um, financial situations to kind of unpick and hand off and manage at that point. 
And I think there's a really interesting piece of work that some leading financial organisation could pick up and take to better manage that and help people prepare for that and create products and services that particularly, again, leveraging open banking could actually amalgamate people's complexity of their life and make it easier for that either handing over of management as they need some support or at the end of life when they're handing it over completely um, to make that a much smoother and more, um, you know, more positive experience. So, and by the way, that's or, very valuable to very very valuable to the banks too, of course, because if you're creating value to a consumer, that is valuable to banks because that value can then be shared. Sorry, Antonio. So, uh, have you seen any interesting applications where, through open banking, you know, family members can support each other uh, to their managing bank, uh, you no, know, the, the, their financial assets. It could be a parent that wants to uh, give more independence to his son or daughter with a disability or to an elderly family member to allow him to be financially independent and avoid some of the risks, let's say, overspending. Have you seen any cases where keeping people secure and everyone comfortable, but at the same time not cutting their independence? I have some. Um, I haven't seen as many as I would like, would be the simple truth of it. Um, there are some organisations, such as I know Barclays has done some work on carer accounts, really considering that how do you provide some controls to uh, a carer without handing over the keys to all of your financial um, requirements. And you know, I certainly know from the community I engage with, and some of them have you know carers that they require to do their banking for them. Um, yeah, you know, there's a lot of fraud. There's a lot of problems with it. Um, there's a lot of financial um, uh, risk that individuals with disabilities have to take right through to, you know, we have friends that when they go to an ATM they have to ask someone to help them that's either, you know, preferably someone in a bank but possibly someone on a street. So, you know, when things aren't well designed people are very, very exposed to risk and what you're talking about there is creating specific products and whether it's an app or whether it's you know, ATMs that work for everyone or um, service solutions that allow handoffs of various controls. There is a lot more potential for it than there are applications for it. There's been some very good work in the UK done by the Money and Mental Health Institute thinking about uh, variable mental health conditions, so people are, say on the bipolar spectrum, um, who have periods where they have very significant spend that might be out of control if they haven't set themselves some financial controls beforehand. Um, and you can essentially create something like um, a Ulyssean bind where you can, um, Ulysses tied himself to a mast as he went past the sirens so that he couldn't you know, react to them in the way that he knew he would otherwise. And in banking you can do the same, that you can set your own self-controls independently but at a time when you're calm, when you've got that moment of mental health that's, that's in a good place to do so. And when you have that, that deterioration later, that you've already set those controls up. And I think um, those sort of products are going to become much more pervasive. The need is far greater than the solutions are that are out there today. So anyone who's interested in innovating in the banking space, let me put a big red flag up here to you that this is a very, very interesting and valuable space that I think would be really useful to a lot of people globally. Um, I'd echo that because these, these are issues that are live for us right now. They're live for me. I mean, some of the stuff you talked about is absolutely resonates with me. You know, my my parents are of, of that generation where they don't necessarily recognise disability it took a long time for people to come to terms with the the concept of disability rather than all oh, my hearing's a bit bad oh yeah no and, and this kind of stuff um and access to banking is difficult you know um the the usability part is difficult that whole user journey is difficult and um actually but but this is not necessarily just about my parents. You talked about the benefit to organizations. Well, 
I've got a great example of this. Um, the company that I work for actually runs a bank. It runs the National Savings and Investment on behalf of the government. We, we, they outsourced it to us and we run it. And, and in the UK, they had something called, you know, pensioner bonds, which, which was in encouraging older people who'd got lots of money to put money into a government bank, get a higher rate of interest and enable the government to have some cash. So um, guess what? Um, that, that became um, something that lots of people took up and they were, um, one, one, uh, I, I got someone at the door, but basically pensioner bonds became really difficult and my parents tried to do it and they ended up calling the service desk. It cost 12 pounds to call the service desk. One second, I'm going to need to answer my door. I'm so sorry. No problem, no problem. I, I'm actually going to pick up on that though, which is we've talked about retail banking to this point. Actually, business banking and particularly SME banking, so small to medium enterprise business banking, so the lower end of business banking is exceptionally poor in the user experience. If you think that retail banking is complex and opaque and, and difficult, mm -hmm. Business banking is, is the poor cousin of retail banking in terms of the way the user experience is often designed. Um, and it is incredibly important, particularly as we look to, you know, many countries are looking to engage, you know, and, and enhance the SME culture and communities because it's a huge engine of potential growth and innovation. And yet we're creating this very large barrier right at the beginning and if you think about the underemployment of people with disabilities by large organisations because of the way recruitment and, and management is run today, a lot of people you know, with specific access needs are choosing to self-employ, set up their own business because they understand their value better than is understood by others. And we're putting bigger barriers on them than we are on retail clients. So let's not think this is a retail banking problem. This is a banking problem and there are humans at the other end of the experience, whether it's retail banking or business banking, at small, medium or even at corporate level business banking, it needs to be accessible, inclusive and improved experiences for everyone. I agree. And I also think, you know, the, uh, I know that a lot of Americans have lost confidence in our banks after, you know, the, the financial crisis that happened uh, years ago. And so there's there's a lot of, you know, the, the, a, a lot of Americans, for example, don't always feel that the banks and the financial financial institutions are really on the consumer side. Of course, you know, that's not really true. We have some amazing uh, organizations. Uh, you were mentioning Barclays. I would mention um, I would mention Citibank that has done a wonderful program uh, with the state of with the New York City uh, with financial literacy to support people with disabilities. So there's a lot of really positive things happening, but still the banks and the financial institutions have black eyes because of previous um, you know corruption and greed. So I think this is another reason why banks need to do stuff like this to make sure all consumers are considered every single aspect of our lives are considered and how you're supporting us and open banking is coming so get ready for it so um uh, let me turn it back over to neil i know we're out of time right. and if you no. want to make a comment um christine uh, please let me give it to you first and then we'll give it to neil go for it i'll just quickly talk about mistrust it's incredibly important and let's recognize this isn't a u.s problem this is absolutely true in the uk where they also had a financial crisis of similar Scale. It's true right across the world, even in Australia, where we didn't, although the financial crisis hit, it didn't hit in the same way because there wasn't over lending to the same degree. Then the Royal Commission's hit in 2015 because of poor product selling and inappropriate um, actions on behalf of banks towards their clients. So this is something that has occurred, you know, across the world. And there are, I, I look at this again, my opportunistic and optimistic soul comes out and I say, this is an opportunity. This is an opportunity for the good banks to step up and say, we are actually going to show you rather than tell you. Actually act with integrity and show people the way in which they're supporting their needs, show the way that they're, they're operating to understand them better and 
the understanding is critical here because at the moment there's not enough listening by the banks of their customers to understand where those gaps and unmet needs are. And I think it's an absolutely fabulous opportunity both for the incumbents who have got brand credibility challenge because that's you know a residual challenge that's carried over from this mistrust, and also for new players to come in and say, we come in without that negative brand. Firstly, recognise that trust is, is easily given, but also you know, once taken away, it's very hard to win back. So you know, come in with integrity and intent and listening, just as we're, we're recommending to banks to do. But there is a real opportunity here to you know, show that actually you know, the organisations are there on the customer's behalf and are going to align value and are going to provide services um, and solutions that are appropriate for them. And actually okay. those, that are, those that are left behind, those that don't make that change um, because of the additional fluidity of being able to get a service layer separate to a product layer, it's going to make it much more easy, you know, much more fluid for people to move towards those that are going to regain trust faster. So there's, there's a lovely piece of kind of regulatory support for that. Excellent. Antonio, I know you, you, you put in the window about you know the, the need for security, cyber security, uh, you know, because that's another area where access to banking is is really primary you've got the ease of use you've got the fact that the older generations have real difficulty using some of the cyber security stuff understanding the importance of it they're nervous so you've got the nervousness about security and then on the other hand the cyber security stuff also puts the onus and the burden on the users which is problematic so so all of these things are an opportunity to do banking better so um uh, and what i was trying to say before bef uh, before the um the guy came back to drop my car off from the garage. <laughs> Sorry about that, folks. Um, was was basically if older people can't use your services on online, they're going to ring you up. Um, and if you're that service provider, the, the the average global cost is around twelve pound per call for something as simple as a password reset. So when you're handling something more complex like opening accounts, that's going to cost you a heck of a lot of money. So that's a real financial opportunity for organisations to either make money or save money or differentiate themselves. Absolutely, so, thank Neil. You. It's a fa it's a fabulous point, and it's one we've yeah. seen reiterated over and over again in the numbers yeah. that we've been working with organisations yeah. in the banking industry. Yeah. Yeah, and it's not like my parents didn't, uh, on this particular case, didn't start either. You know, they went, oh yeah, we created the first account. That was okay, on, you know, um, but when we tried to link mine and your dad's together, then it became a real problem. So we ended up stopping doing it online and we called the nice man. And that yes, call to the yes. nice man means that actually you've spent on two things. You've spent on your online service and then you've had to spend on your offline telephone service as well so you're, you're, you're doubling up on your cost so getting it right um, digitally and getting it right in the whole customer journey is super important I know but we're at the end of Neil, time Neil, oh go on at that just that one point you made and you're you you've um, shaken the confidence of your parents even Absolutely. more so they're not going to try the online next time sorry yeah. Neil. no 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 very good point very good point. So um, we're at the end of our time. Thank you, Christine. I need to, of course, thank um, you know my clear text and Barclays, tugging of the forelock to Barclays for doing such a good job in this area, um, and then also highlight the fact that our other supporter, Microlink, were recently awarded the DNI Initiative of the Year Award. Um, at the for disability diversity at uh, Inclusive Tech Alliance Awards. So well done to to Mike Link, well done to Barclays, and thank you to my ClearText because you do a great job on the captioning. Thank you very much, everyone, and I'm really looking forward to the the chat on Tuesday night. Thank you. Lovely to catch up with you all.